Jack Kleinfeld of Kleinfeld Technical Services. Welcome to uh, a brief webinar on heat transfer applications uh, using FEA. Uh, Thank you. You will now be joined to the conference. If you need operator assistance, please press star, then zero, and an operator will come online to assist you. Okay. Uh, I'm seeing about a third of the, thirty hit red, and the rest of you either didn't or can't hear me. That's not a good sign. Arvind, uh, how comfortable are we with that result? I think we are okay because most people probably didn't uh, pay attention to it. I think we can proceed because if uh, do they, they do have a problem, guys, please uh, type in your questions, and I can I'll be happy to relay relay that message to Jack to. Uh, I think we are we are good, Jack. We okay, start. great. Yeah. Thank you, Arvin. If uh, those of you who hit the red will go back to green, so I, when you do need uh, me to slow down, I'll know that you mean it. I'd appreciate that. Uh, just briefly, uh, as I said, I'm Jack Kleinfeld. I've been a user of uh, FEA methods for heat transfer analysis primarily for probably about 10 years. Uh, my experience has been with uh, what was structural research products and is now SolidWorks product. Uh, so that's kind of my background. Uh, the people at Cosmos uh, were aware of this and sort of said, hey, would I mind doing a, a, a webinar on, on these applications? And I said I'd be delighted. Uh, in the next slide here, just an overview of what you will see on your screen and where you need to worry about things. Uh, you can see on the um, left side here, you have the seating tab and the audio information. Uh, if you're using voice over IP rather than the phone, you can click here for the audio. If you have questions, type them in here and uh, Arvind will field them. Uh, we'll be answering uh, questions as a Q&A session at the end. If it's something that uh, can be handled easily, then uh, he'll type those back to you. If you want to see uh, more of the application if the window's too small, you can uh, click here. Uh, what we'll be doing, uh, I'm going to present a, uh, several examples of heat transfer calculations using finite element analysis methods. And what I want you to do is understand the scope of the applications. And uh, by the end of this, hope, hopefully you will be in a position to recognize when FEA-based heat transfer would be a useful tool for you. Uh, the examples I'm going to be using are essentially demonstration level. They're not uh, detailed uh, engineering. Uh, they're not uh, refined in some cases, although in some cases they are. And you'll see this as we go along. To start off with, uh, we've got a couple of polls uh, we'd like you to respond to. And the first is, are you currently using uh, analysis products? If you are, uh, please click the appropriate box, whether it's Cosmos Works, other Cosmos products, such as Design Star or Cosmos M, uh, other analysis products, or not using any currently. And that's whether you're using them for stress and strain, or electromagnetic, or heat transfer, or anything else. And I'll give that a, a few minutes to, uh, for people to vote. Okay, uh, we've got, uh, just for your information, uh, a little less than half of you are not using current, currently using products, and uh, about a third of you are using Cosmos Works, a uh, quarter perhaps other analysis products. So that's a good mix, and uh, I think the uh, work I got cut out for me is going to work all right. Uh, the next one is, in terms of thermal analysis, uh, what is your experience? Uh, currently using it, uh, have used it in the past, but not currently. Uh, you sort of know it's there, but not actually how to ever use it. Uh, it's new to you. Uh, you think you're going to need it. It's new to you, and right now you don't have a clue.
the numbers are still coming in. Not as many people voted as the last time. But we've got pretty much, frankly, an even split uh, on the first four and then a, a somewhat smaller fraction uh, on the last one. All right, I'm going to move ahead with the presentation. Uh, the areas of application for heat transfer analysis are, as you see them, product design, product and process analysis and control, quality control, uh, development, uh, validation, application for various types of, inf of instrumentation, and infrared thermography. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about infrared thermography. It's one of the things I do. It's one of the primary product products and services of my company. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a, in a couple of slides. Uh, you see on my logo that the other thing, one of the next thing is finite element analysis, and that is primarily uh, heat transfer applications. So we'll be talking about that uh, as we get to it. Uh, why, why do this? Well, you want to predict what's going to happen, or something has happened and you want to understand it. Uh, you want to explain it to somebody else and demonstrate why what happened makes sense or didn't make sense or needs to be changed or can be taken advantage of. Uh, and you want to explore methods for changing that behavior as well as for uh, taking advantage of the behavior. So you're looking at physical phenomena. Uh, generally, when people say FEA, they think stress strain uh, type applications. Uh, this is very much a different application, but one that overlaps it. You can use uh, thermal analysis in conjunction with stress strain to look at that. Uh, I'm not going to be giving examples of that, but I do want to let you know that it is there. Uh, the time frames, uh, and this is in terms of what the problem is uh, that you're analyzing. It can be a steady state. In other words, something is uh, time invariant. Or transient analysis, uh, both something simple where you turn an object on and you want to know how it warms up or cools down, or a complex uh, system where you have uh, variable uh, boundary conditions for the thing. So for example, the sun begins to shine on a wall, it, it, it warms up, and then this, you know, the sun keeps moving, it comes off the wall, it begins to cool down, and other things go on at the same time, air temperature changes. Um, surroundings change. Uh, the, the other side of that wall, they turn an air conditioner on. So you have uh, a fair degree of variability in uh, those time variant boundary conditions. And I'm, we're going to see some examples of that. Uh, the tools I've used uh, are both Cosmos Works and Cosmos M. Uh, and I've often used them with SolidWorks as a front end. I, in fact, my, my experience was initially as a Cosmos M user, which does not use uh, SolidWorks particularly, although you can use SolidWorks and then export to Cosmos M. Design Star is another product, and uh, I honestly do not have personal experience with it. Uh, E-transfer basics. I'm going to assume that most of you uh, have enough of a uh, background to let me go very quickly through this. Uh, three basic types of heat transfer are conduction, convection, and radiation. In conduction, what you're dealing with is uh, movement by the vibration of the molecule, making the next molecule vibrate. So it's movement of heat through a solid, essentially. Uh, convection is movement through um, uh, mass transfer. You've got a warm fluid uh, moving from one location to another and taking heat with it. Uh, the third one is radiation, and uh, generally uh, would be infrared radiation, and you may have heard that term when I said infrared thermography, so there's a connection there. Uh, but the radiation is uh, transfer across open or empty space uh, by electromagnetic uh, field radiation. I'm going to talk briefly about just what infrared thermography is, because some of these examples that I'm going to be presenting to you are uh, based on it or based around it, and many people have not heard of it. It's essentially taking pictures of temperature. It's using an infrared or thermally sensitive camera. Uh, it's image-based, and it looks at an object, and it records the radiation in the infrared uh, region that's coming at the camera. That's then interpreted as temperature. Uh, it's used instead of contact methods, such as thermocouples. Uh, and it offers both visual information and detailed temperature information. So you can get images, and you can get measurement. And uh, it's a powerful tool. Uh, 
an example of the equipment that's used. Uh, these are radiometric imagers. In other words, they provide both an image and temperature measurement. Are as shown. These are approximately the size of camcorders. You can see that these are handheld. There are larger and smaller uh, pieces of equipment. They're quite sensitive. Uh, they're quite accurate. Uh, the one on the left, which is a, a sample of the one I use, is sensitive, is rated at a sensitivity, just as a reference for you, of 70 millikelvin. Uh, that's 0 0.07 degrees centigrade, temperature sensitivity at 30 degrees centigrade. So it's uh, good stuff. The physics involved is that all bodies above absolute zero will emit infrared radiation. The amount of that radiation, the wavelength distribution of that radiation are uh, dependent on the temperature and the emissivity of the body. The emissivity is uh, essentially a physical characteristic of the surface of the body. Things are reflective, have low emissivity. Things are non-reflective, have high emissivity. And emissivity is, ranges from 0 to 1. Uh, examples of infrared images, and uh, this was an engineering application that it came from. You're looking at a tube sheet in a hot water boiler. You've got gas coming out of the holes here, here, here. You've got uh, a flame combustion system up above here. And you can see a thermocouple's been mounted, uh, not properly for good measurement, by the way. And you can see at the, cross, at the crosshairs here, uh, temperature measurements in Fahrenheit, uh, in the six, mid-600 Fahrenheit range. And this was then used as part of an ASME pressure vessel uh, code um, validation on a new uh, boiler design. They needed to know what metallurgy would be required, so we were able to measure it here. Heat transfer analysis integrates very well with infrared because infrared is measuring temperatures. And as I uh, point out to infrared thermographers, the temperature gets there by heat transfer. Uh, analysis of heat transfer can tell us what to expect how to achieve results, how to interpret results, how to make things visible which might not otherwise be visible. So we do heat transfer in conjunction with infrared, either before it, after it, or during it, so that we know what's going on. Uh, the case studies I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you several. Uh, in the steady state, I'm going to show you an example of an analysis of a recovery boiler spout, uh, another one for can you detect buried pipe, Another one for uh, detecting and quantifying the temperature of a hot spot in electrical equipment when you can't actually see the hot spot. And uh, an example of a very simple calculation of the impact of a reflective coating on the temperature of an object. Uh, the transients I'm going to show will be uh, wall moisture and delamination. Uh, this is an infrared application. Uh, Buried pipe, by the way, is also an infrared application. Uh, we'll be looking in the wall moisture at uh, how the temperature of the surface of a wall changes in response to whether it's wet, whether it's delaminated, or whether it's a sound wall over a 24-hour cycle of solar exposure, air temperature changes, and the like. And the last example there will be an example in a, a process application, uh, a catheter ma manufacturer, where uh, a square, square cut tube is put into a heated die to, to round off the end of the uh, cut so it can be used in medical applications. OK, we'll start off with the steady state examples. And uh, what I'm going to show you first is a thermal analysis of a failed recovery boiler spout. Uh, recovery boilers are used in the pulp mill, uh, in the uh, pulp and paper industry, and what they do is they take molten salts out of the bottom of the recovery boiler. So these are very hot. They, they are water cooled inside the spout, and the, the spout is an open spout uh, where the uh, smelt, the, the uh, melted salt runs. Uh, you don't want the water and the smelt to mix. It's a good way to blow up the boiler, and that happens with uh, an unfortunate regularity. Uh, but what happened is one of these spouts had failed and, in fact, did cause uh, a local uh, explosion. Uh, and it was suspected that there was a bad well inside the uh, water cooling path. And uh, we did an analysis to see whether or not uh, that weld would have caused the type of failure that was observed. What you see here, and this was done in Cosmos M, and uh, what you see here is a cross section of the spout. So this area here is where the water water cooling is. 
the smelt is leaving the boiler up here and flows over this surface uh, down the spout and is discharged at the end into a receiving vessel. Uh, this area has the water flow. Uh, you got very hot source here, and there was a suspect bad weld in this area. This analysis that you're looking at is for uh, a good spout. The uh, bad spout analysis, because of the bad weld here, didn't have the same degree of cooling. And you can see that the temperatures here have gotten hotter. This is on the same temperature scale as the previous. And also, you can see that the isotherms, the areas of constant temperature, are now uh, quite severely curved. So it made, made sense that, indeed, uh, there was a um, failure uh, of the spout due to a bad weld. I don't know if you can read it, but uh, the temperature up here is uh, 1,237 degrees, and the temperature up here is 1,143 degrees. So there's a fair increase in that temperature. Uh, detection of buried pipe. Uh, this is, relates to an infrared application. If you have hot pipe buried in the ground and you don't know where it is, question can be, can you locate it? There's a secondary question of could you find a leak if it was leaking, and the leaks are easier to find uh, than just the pipe, but this is kind of a test case for that. So what you have is uh, ground, and this was based on concrete in terms of the physical properties that were used. And you want to know what the impact of the depth of the burial of the pipe and wind conditions. Uh, additional studies could be done where you're looking at uh, the diameter of the pipe, how well insulated it is, what the uh, process temperature inside the pipe is, and what the air temperature above uh, the ground is. The physical layout, uh, you've got the thermographer standing here on the ground. And uh, this is now this that's the surface of the ground, and here's the burial. Here's a quarter diameter of the pipe. This was done using symmetry to reduce the size of the problem. Uh, the particular one shown here is for seven and a half inch deep burial. The area of interest is uh, was specified as a ten inches from the over the center line sideways to the pipe. The model itself was extended out to two hundred inches in this direction. Uh, the, air, the things that were looked at is what's the temperature right over the center line, what's the profile over this 10-inch span, and what's the difference between this center line temperature and the temperature at 10 inches. Uh, and that difference is termed the contrast because if we have an elevated temperature all the way across, we kind of still can't find the pipe. We need to see a difference between what's here and what's here to know, oh, the pipe is in this area. Um, and that kind of repeats what I, this slide sort of repeats what I just told you, that we're interested in the area here, the temperature of the center line, and the contrast between this location and that location. This is a sample result from that model. This is shown for a five inch depth of pipe. Uh, the thermographer, you and I standing on the ground, are only seeing this and then out further. Uh, the analysis is giving us additional information. Now, this is you know nice, smooth curves because this is just concrete with pipe in it. If we were concerned about what's the impact of an additional pipe or an empty spot or a tank or something else here or here or here or concrete curbing there, it's easy enough to modify this and then uh, find out what else is going on. And as uh, People doing FEA, we can find out what's going on inside, which the thermographer is not in a position to know. Uh, selected results. Uh, this is the surface temperature, all for still air at various depths. You can see for the one inch depth, you get a real high center, center line temperature, and it drops off rapidly. Uh, as the depth increases, the center line temperature goes down and the curve becomes flatter and flatter to the point where you know, you're not going to find it when it's deeper than 20 or 30 inches, which are these curves down at the bottom here. Uh, another example of the results is uh, now just for a 10-inch depth looking at the effect of a wind velocity, which affects the uh, convective heat transfer coefficient on the surface of the ground. And you can see as the wind increases, uh, the profile gets flatter. So the, the higher the wind velocity, the more difficult it's going to be to find it. 
And a summary of the results, uh, this is uh, plotted, uh, the, the top curve is the center line temperature plotted against this here. And uh, this is the temperature at a 10 inch distance plotted also against that axis. And then the contrast is this middle curve with the arrow on it, excuse me, plotted uh, on the right side. And you can see somewhere in the 15 to 20, 25 inch depth, you're getting down to very small contrasts, and you're also getting down to very flat curves and not much of a temperature rise. So somewhere in this area, uh, the thermographer would know if, it's, if he's told that the, that the pipe is probably 20 inches deep or 30 inches deep, uh, he needs to tell the customer who's asking him to find it, uh, I probably can't find it. It's not worth paying me to come out there. So you're using the, the FEA, you're using the heat transfer analysis to uh, be smarter about how you apply the IR. Uh, you're also using it, uh, not shown here, to be able to say, you know, your pipe is uh, 200 degrees uh, and it's real marginal. Uh, could you raise the process temperature to 250 for a day? Because if you do that, I think I can find your pipe. So you're, you're allowing yourself the luxury of understanding what's going on using the analysis to then say, what do I need to do next? Uh, just a couple of infrared images as examples of these are hot buried pipes. Uh, this one has some severe problems. You see it's 0 to 120 Fahrenheit. This one is 23 to 38 Fahrenheit. These are taken at the same location. You can see also here the, uh, the pipe is not as well insulated in the uh, elbow. You can also tell that this guy over here got to work later than this guy over here because his engine is still hotter. Uh, sealed electrical component. Uh, transformer would be an example. Uh, I'm using an extremely simple hypothetical component here. Uh, you've got a failure going on inside that's causing a hot spot to be generated, and you need to know that as the operator of the plant, of the equipment. Uh, but the, you can't open it up to measure it, either by contact measurement or by infrared. You can only see what's going on on the outside case. So but what, you, what the thermographer, what the, what the physical layout looks like is you've got a device that looks like this, and you can look at the outside of it. Uh, were you able to remove the case, you would see that the inside, in this case, is just a simple contactor, and we're, we're saying that we've got a bad contact, either dirty, loose, connect, loose corrosion, whatever, here, causing it to have a hot spot. And uh, this is what the thermographer would see, although this is an FEA result as a sample. And you can see there's a hot spot right here, and it's 27 degrees above ambient. So you got a 27 degree rise. Uh, if we look inside, which you can do with the FEA, uh, we see that, in fact, we've got a 200 degree rise. And that's significantly more. So having that kind of information is something that gives you a tool to understand what's going on, be able to relate what is measurable to what you need to uh, infer. And whether the measurement is uh, infrared is, is often what I do, or if the measurement is a thermocouple, or uh, we're concerned about um, if we've got a hot spot here, what's the temperature there? It, it's not even necessarily that you um, can measure one but not the other, but how do you relate one to, to the other? So you can, in this case, you can actually develop a set of graphs to use in the field as guidance. Uh, this is a sample of that graph. And on the bottom, we have the exterior temperature, the one you can see. And it's plotted as a rise above ambient. And over here, we have it, the interior temperature as a rise. Uh, the two curves, one are for a component that has air in it, and the, other one is for the, the, the upper one is for a component with vacuum in it, which has fewer methods for getting the heat out. So it has a larger rise. But for example, if you had a 40 degree observed rise outside in a vacuum component, you'd be expecting a 300 degree rise uh, at the point of interest. Uh, this is not uh, an infrared thermography example. I'm not married to infrared, although we go out steadily. Uh, here you have a part, a very simple made up part, but the underside of it, the side that's sitting on top of the screen, if you will, is exposed to a 200 Fahrenheit air uh, and a 900 degree radiation source. A possible example of this would be a um, floor of a car right over the exhaust pipe. Uh, so this kind of looks like a gear shift, but you know it's, as I said, a super simplified example. This is the physical part. This was done in SolidWorks. 
uh, the uh, result of the tra heat transfer analysis with an unprotected part is that you're getting up to 585 degrees Fahrenheit at the tip here. And I'm sorry, 585 on the top of the plate and 480 or so at the top of the knob. Uh, if you put a very high reflective coating on the bottom, very reflective, very low emissivity, like aluminum foil or gold foil, on the bottom of this plate, the radiation portion, uh, which is the non-contact transfer, virtually goes away. And simply by changing the physical uh, boundary condition for that, you can rerun this rapidly, easily, uh, virtually no cost for the additional step. And you see that the plate surface now is at 157, and the knob is 140. So there's been a major temperature drop. And you've done this uh, on the computer uh, without a lab and done it easily and rapidly. Uh, transient examples I want to share with you. Let's start with the moisture and the lamination. Uh, what I'm showing you first is a photograph of uh, the side of a building. And you can see that the building has had some patchwork done already on it. It's, it's a building with problems. And then you've got uh, two infrared images, uh, actually the same image, one in grayscale and one in color palette, uh, to show you where the problems are. This is taken with the sun shining on the building. And these white bright areas are hot. And they are suspected delamination, where the surface of the building is, is peeling off the underlayment. The dark areas here, and especially here where it's irregularly shaped, are areas where water has gotten into the wall and is staying in the wall. So these cooler areas, the darker, cooler, uh, darker, cooler, um, are areas where there's moisture in the building. Uh, so that's kind of what it's all about. And I'll just show you a couple of examples that have marked. You've got the lamination going on here and here. You've got moisture here. And you, you can see what a strange shape you've got there, similarly between the window and the air conditioner here. Uh, more of the same. And by measurement using the camera, I know that there's approximately a 9 degree Fahrenheit difference between the wet areas, or the wet area here, and the sound area and the delaminated area and the sound area. So nine, you know, 9 degrees is more than enough to see with the infrared camera. But let's explain this using FEA and heat transfer analysis. So I built a very simple model, uh, three sections of wall uh, connected to each other. Uh, the bottom one is delaminated. And if you look carefully, you'll see there's a uh, blue layer that's thin here. And that represents a thin layer of air. So the, uh, the pink piece of wall is not well connected to the uh, underlying terracotta in this case. This has moisture in it, and this is a dry or sound wall. Uh, the advantage of doing them this way as a single model that runs at once is that you can uh, understand how the temperatures diffuse between the different sections. And uh, that's helpful to, to the thermographer in terms of how much can he see uh, when he goes ahead and, and looks at the wall. Let's discuss a little bit the boundary conditions, pure heat a pure heat transfer conversation. Uh, one, we have convection to air. There's air inside the building, which in this case was taken as a constant temperature. It's controlled conditions. And there's air outside the building, which is a varying temperature. Uh, gets warmer in the daytime, gets colder at night. Uh, and there's solar loading. Uh, the solar loading can be entered as a heat flux on the surface. And it's uh, uh, affected by time. It's a transient condition. But it's also affected by uh, where in the world you are, what latitude you're at, uh, the date, time of year, uh, and the orientation of the wall, whether it's a north wall, a south wall, east wall, et cetera. And that information is available in the literature. So you can take all of those factors, time, latitude, date, orientation, uh, and develop a uh, time-dependent uh, boundary condition. There's also radiation, and that is essentially uh, the sun warms the wall up, and the wall radiates back to the world. And it interchanges with what I've called the sky temperature. Uh, it radiates back to the sky. It radiates down to the ground. Uh, so sky temperature is uh, in quotes because it's really going to uh, some kind of an average world temperature. This is a typical result uh, of that model. 
this is a 10 a.m. example. Uh, this is for the same exposure of wall as you saw in the uh, images, the infrared and the photo. Uh, and you can see what's happened here. This has been in the sun now for a while. The hottest area is the delaminated area because this section of wall is isolated from the body of the wall. So you, sh you warm it up, and it can't dump heat in as well. Uh, the wet area is the coolest. It's dumping heat well, and it's absorbing heat better than the dry area, than the dry and sound area, which is warming up and is intermediate in temperature between the other two. You can see that you got a high temperature drop uh, across this delamination. Uh, and I'll show you now. These are not uh, on common temperature scales. Uh, each one is kind of optimized to let you see what's going on. But at midnight, uh, you can see that the delaminated is the coldest, whereas uh, at noon or so, it's the hottest. And similarly, you get a, a change over a 24-hour cycle uh, here, and you can see that it gets back to midnight at this image. Um, Analytically, you can take that data from the FEA, from the, from the heat transfer analysis, and plot it. The curves here are plots from the analysis. The magenta is a wet area, the green is a delaminated area, and the blue is uh, the sound area. And you can see at night, this is midnight here and uh, midnight there. At night, uh, the wet areas are the warmest of the three. Under solar loading, they're the coolest of the three. The reverse is true for the delaminated area, which is the coldest at night and the hottest in the daytime. And there's a crossover shortly after the sun hits it and shortly after the sun leaves it. This is for that southeast exposure. Uh, the data points are from the infrared, and they, they show the same behavior. They're not exactly lined up, but this is, uh, in my view, excellent agreement. Uh, this is the contrast between those areas, and you can see from the FEA that you don't expect the peak contrast for uh, one the wet to dry to be at the same time as the peak contrast for the uh, dry to the laminated. So it says if you're looking for one, you may need to be there at a different time of day than if you're looking for the other. The FEA is telling you that. Once you've set that up, it's very easy to say, oh, you know, I'm interested in a wall that's a western wall. Well, the air chemistries are the same. Everything is the same except for the solar uh, loading. And you change that one boundary condition, rerun the model, and you get the different results. And you can see they are very different in terms of the shape. Uh, the peak occurs at different times. You've got different uh, shoulders on it because of the air temperature interaction being different than it was before. And you can look at the contrasts. And I'm not going to make you look at the details of that. I don't think that's why you're here. Uh, I'm going to show you now a, um, an animation, two animations coming out of that uh, result. And uh, Arvin, you need to let me be sure that you see this. And I'm starting the animation now. What you should be seeing is uh, a title slide. Is that showing up, Garvin? Yes. Yes, Jack. Good. Uh, this is the temperature plot straight out of the FEA software. And you see I, I've overlaid uh, the time on it. You can see how this got hotter, much hotter at the bottom where the, where the, the lamination is. The heat is now coming back out of the wall. Uh, it's now much colder where it was delaminated. And you can understand what's going on in terms of the heat flow. I'm going to let you look at that one more time. It's, it's short enough that I think we can spare the time. Uh, so you're seeing a 24-hour cycle. Uh, you're seeing it uh, you know, with time stamps on it. Uh, the temperature scale is uniform now. And you can see how the heat flows in. You can see much higher temperature drops across that delamination. You can see as well what's going on on the inside surface of the wall at the edges there, at least. And you see how the, uh, the three types of wall are interacting with each other. Uh, what I want to show you now is, um, and I think I'm going to stop the sharing for a moment and get the other one up. I'm going to show you the same kind of uh, simulation, but now instead of temperature, I'm going to show you heat flux. And it's plotted now as a vector rather than uh, a color scale. And uh, you can see the arrows represent the heat flowing out of the wall. Uh, they're now, uh, the sun has hit the wall. You can see it's flooding into the, into the wall. Sun leaves the wall, and it starts to flood out. 
uh, one of the things that I want you to uh, observe, and I'll show it to you a second time so you can, is that the arrows are essentially horizontal. They're going straight in and straight out of the wall, except at the top of that delamination where the air gap was. And there you see one, you have the largest, there it is, the largest arrows and the greatest flux, and you also have them essentially climbing over the top of that uh, delamination and then climbing back down into the wall. So you can show this to yourself, you can show this to your clients, you can show this to the guy doing a design on something, and you can, as a result, uh, gain a real good understanding of what's going on uh, and why is it doing what it's doing and how do you take advantage of it and uh, what do you need to do next. Uh, I, I hope that's fairly clear. Uh, I found out that I couldn't actually point to the videos the way I can point to the PowerPoint, so I, I hope I described it well for you. Uh, what we found from the wall study is that, one, the IR worked as we hoped uh, based on our understanding of the physics. It revealed wet and delaminated areas, and I showed you those samples. Structural details, and I didn't discuss this, were also shown. Where you have the ends of floors meeting the exterior wall, that's uh, adding more mass to what, the, what, what ha that, that can absorb heat, uh, which is the same as how the water works. The wet areas are absorbing heat differently because they've, they've got more thermal mass to absorb it, so they have less of a temperature swing. And the structural details behave the same way. But we found that heat transfer modeling, using the FEA approach, matched the infrared results. It gave us more information. It gave us guidance and helped us interpret the results. And it's an economical adjunct to the infrared, as it would be economical adjunct to pretty much anything else you want to do. Uh, talk a little bit about the last example, and that's a transient analysis of a catheter dye uh, undergoing both heating and cooling. And I consider this an example of uh, both a process and an instrumentation application. Uh, and you can use it to study how is your equipment running. How do you improve how the equipment runs? How do you change your cycling? How do you change your target temperatures? How do you decide where to put your instrumentation? Uh, and I'm going to, the next slide shows you uh, the, the model of the, the die itself. So what, what you have here is the full die and then a cutaway view. What happens is uh, this outer, the, the large circle is mounted in a, a uh, solid block. And this and this are free, free, free standing. Uh, they're heated inductively uh, so that uh, this area gets the, these areas get the hottest. Uh, when the temperature is appropriate, a uh, cut end tube is inserted into here, forced against this hemispherical end. So you get a rounding of the tube, and that creates the catheter. It's then allowed the, the induction heating is then turned off. It's allowed to cool. Cooling air is blown on these two sections, so it cools more rapidly. You withdraw the tube, and then you start all over. Uh, the temperature you're most interested in is right here. You can't measure it there because you can't get at it. Uh, you can use uh, either thermocouples, or a manufacturer was interested in using infrared sensors, essentially the same physics as I've discussed with you, to measure it here. Easier to do it here because it's a bigger piece. So one question is, well, you know, how big an error am I going to introduce if I measure it here versus measure it here? And that's part of part of what we looked at. Well, uh, very briefly, and this is the, the wordiest slide I'm going to show you, but this is the program of the die. It, as I said, has induction heating. Uh, I applied the heat in the model throughout the volume of the die. Induction heating, in fact, tends to be a surface phenomena, so most of the heat would be on the surface of the uh, the outside surface of the die. So this is a, an approximation. Total energy input of 50 watts. 60% applied to the small section, which is what they try to do, and 40% to that intermediate section. Uh, then cooling applied to selected outside surfaces, and that cooling was varied uh, in terms of heat transfer coefficient uh, to allow both natural convection, which happened during the heating and during the hold parts of the cycle, and then forced convection, which is the blowing air, uh, higher heat transfer coefficient uh, for the large, for the uh, two smaller diameters, and direct contact to the metal uh, holding block for the largest diameter. Heating takes two seconds, and then you go from uh, up to 2.1 seconds, you ramp it down to zero, you hold it until three seconds at zero, and then you start cooling it. Uh, the cooling goes full flow by 3.1 seconds, and you hold that out to 18 seconds, and you're ready to start again. 
uh, sample results. Uh, this is at the end of the heating period, two seconds. You can see that uh, you're up to 280 degrees pretty uniformly at that hemispherical end. And then things cool off here. Remember, this section is mounted in a, a steel block, which is pretty much holding its temperature down. Uh, at the end of 18 seconds, things cool off a fair bit. And you can see that you know the peak temperature is perhaps 170 Fahrenheit. Uh, again, easy to do with the uh, FEA. Analysis samples uh, of the results. You can see uh, the traces of the temperature over the time of the cycle uh, at various locations, both inside and outside. Uh, the, the narrow end and the uh, the narrow end and the middle bar middle of the barrel. Uh, you can also estimate the errors. This is the difference of the temperature between the inside of the tube and that outside. Uh, and you can see if you're measuring at the middle, there's a relatively small error. And if you're measuring it at the uh, tight end, there's a much bigger error. So you've got a five and a half degree, a five and a quarter degree error at the end of the heating cycle, which then falls off as things even out. If that's too big an error, you're going to have to do something different about your instrumentation. If that's an acceptable error, fine. If it's an error that you need to be concerned about uh, but could just correct for, this curve from the heat transfer analysis is going to tell you, OK, measure the outside. And based on where you are in the cycle, subtract this number from the value or add this number to the value of your reading to know what the, what the catheter itself is experiencing. So what are we seeing? We've seen a set of examples of steady state and trans, uh, transient heat tra transfer. Uh, I've included conduction, convection, and radiation examples. Uh, you've seen that they apply to things as uh, large as buildings and small industrial parts. You've seen examples of 24-hour cycles and 18-second cycles. And you can go a lot shorter than 18 seconds. Uh, what I need to say, I think, is that you know, heat transfer analysis using FEA is a fast and useful approach for analyzing heat transfer and its effects. We have not dealt in any of this with uh, uh, fluid flow. Uh, and there are tools for that. Uh, Structural Research or uh, SolidWorks offers one. Uh, but I'm going to stop there. Uh, there are a couple of polls I'd like you to take. And then we'll open it up for questions. Uh, the first uh, poll is, hey, how did we do? Uh, did we tell you stuff that you needed to hear, uh, sort of, or gee, you just really thought you'd get something different? And uh, I try to get Arvin to disable the bottom two buttons, but he just wouldn't cooperate. So you, it's an honest poll. You can get the vote how you like. OK. Uh, I'll uh, tell you what the results were by saying thank you for the votes. Uh, the next one, uh, how was your viewing experience? Uh, did you, were you seeing what I thought you needed to see? Were you, you know, was it clear? Uh, and I guess this also relates to whether this, the pace and, and the timing was such that uh, it worked for you. And again, uh, I'm pleased uh, that most of you uh, had a good experience. So thank you uh, from me. Uh, thank you on behalf of uh, the SolidWorks team. Uh, I didn't say it before. I'm not an employee of SolidWorks. I'm an independent. I'm a user of their products. Uh, and uh, let's wor work it up for uh, question and answer period. Arvind, do well, you have any comments yes. or Q&A? Thank you very much, Jack. That was uh, indeed a very enlightening presentation. Really gave us a good flavor of where uh, FEA can be used in a variety of heat transfer applications. And being a great presentation, we had, uh, I think we have quite a bit of questions to answer. So Jack is going to answer your question. I'm going to throw, throw him at uh, him. The one question which several people asked is, what is the cost of the infrared equipment that you showed there? You know, just to get an approximate picture of. How, how, how much these equipments cost? Uh, not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one that I'm using, that the camera I showed you on the left, uh, it's no longer manufactured. But when new, uh, you were looking at forty to fifty thousand uh, dollars. 
Uh, I have that camera. I have a set of lenses for it as well, not just a single standard lens. I've got a telephoto lens. I've got a wide-angle lens. I've got a macro lens, so I can do a, uh, a close-up where I see just my fingertip, and I can show you the sweat glands in my finger. Uh, so all told, I've got you know close to five figures invested in equipment plus specialized software for its analysis. The, the, the images themselves need specialized software as well. So you're looking at a chunk of change. And if anybody would like me to you know do infrared for them, uh, it's JK Engineer at KleinfeldTechnical.com. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, sure. Another question is uh, to operate these infrared uh, thermography equipment. Uh, is there any special training? Uh, you know, if people want to get into this field. Where where would they go? I mean, where, where would uh, do you offer any kind of do you train people, or is there places out there, there are universities, are there training centers out there that uh, people can make use of? There are a few training companies that provide training. Uh, the wisdom is, if you're going to get into infrared before you buy a camera, a lot of people recommend taking a level one training course. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to know what you're going to be doing with it. Um, I would, you know, Armin, I, I, I am delighted and I enjoy talking about infrared. Uh, if you want me to continue to do so, I will, but <laughs> no, that's not quite why we had the, why we had the uh, webinar. <laughs> no, no, absolutely no problem. But these are questions asked, so I just thought sure. it would be justice to them. Uh, thank you. That That's perfect. So it looks like they may have to search for training near that. I mean, if people want to contact me, they're, they're welcome to. Okay. Um, does thermography accurately account for angle of incidence to the object is one of the questions asked, so you may want to touch upon that. Uh, not in and of itself. Uh, angle of incidence will affect uh, the radiation coming off of it. Where possible, you want to be looking square on. That's the most accurate. Uh, at an angle, uh, one, the amount of radiation, depending on the type of material, falls off. And two, uh, you've got increased issues of reflection of other objects. Uh, so. You need to be smart about how you interpret it, and I guess that comes back to the, the, the previous question. Okay. Training is necessary to do this right. You can go out and buy a camera, uh, and you can offer your services, or you can go out and buy a camera and use your services within your company. But uh, unless you get training, uh, you're dangerous. <laughs> sure. Um, then uh, another question asked is, can FEA be used for determining potential problem confidence in a process R1? So, uh, that's probably a specific question to a uh, I'm not sure I understood. Can, can FEA be used to determine whether uh, uh, there's a heat problem in it? Yeah, there are potential problems in the conference involved uh, for a process oven. And I assume the answer to be is yes, but I wasn't sure what a process oven is, so I thought probably. Uh, uh, I missed one word. Uh, po potential problems in the confidence? Uh, potential problems in the components which are there in a process oven. A process oh, 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 yeah, in a process oven. Yeah, oven. Yes, uh, you can do. You know, you, if you have an oven uh, and you're, you know, you're heating parts and you want to know what the distribution of heat in the part is, uh, you need to know the heat transfer through the part itself because the interior of the part needs to reach a certain temperature, or you need to get the outside very hot before the inside gets too hot. You know, baked Alaska. Uh, yes, you can use heat transfer analysis in both directions. Uh, are we getting the inside hot enough? Are you getting the inside uh, too hot? Uh, are the parts of the oven being uh, overheated? Uh, so yes, and you would use that. Uh, and by you know another picture infrared, you can use you can use infrared as a front end to determine uh, what your boundary conditions for the FEA should be. And another um, question which was asked is, how was the moisture model? You, I know you mentioned moisture in the yes. uh, in one of your uh, where the building um, example is. Um, they want to know how you modeled it in the FEA. Okay, I I've published a couple of papers on that, and I, I've taken a, a simple approach. Uh, I established the properties of the uh, drywall. And uh, what I propose up to a reasonable moisture content is that you can take a linear addition uh, by weight, by mass, of the properties of the water and add them to the properties of the uh, masonry. So uh, it's 100% of the uh, density of the uh, dry wall plus 20% uh, for 20% wet wall of the density of water, and you get a, a denser assembly. Essentially, the water is filling in empty space, so I can defend that model. And, and as you saw, the results are, 
uh, quite encouraging. Mm -hmm. And how about the thermal conductivities um, of that particular? Well, the the, the, the dry solids uh, essentially out of handbook sources. Mm -hmm. uh, thermal conductivity of water can be looked up and was looked up, and I use the same approach for the thermal conductivity in terms of a linear addition by mass fracturing. Okay. Uh, another one question which was asked is how is the wet and dry areas defined? And I guess it's probably the same question that you just answered. Um, yeah, I mean the, the dry area was good wall. The wet area was good wall with an admixture of, of the thermal conductivity, the uh, heat capacity, and the mass of water based on approximately 20, I think if I remember correctly, 20% uh, moisture content. Uh, there was, there, so several people have asked about moisture, so that's good that um, we touched upon those questions. Uh, let's see, there are a few questions here waiting. Um, when applying power, is it better to apply power to a split line area or create a model and apply power to the model? So this is, I think this is a question related to FEA. Uh, yeah, it is, but I'm, but I'm not sure. That I, I, I think taken out of context, I can't answer that question. I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. So I guess it's probably more dependent on the problem or... or I, I think I, the right answer to that is it's model dependent. And I, 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 I think the person who asked the question has a specific model in mind, and I don't have that model in mind. Yeah. Uh, well, he said, how is temperature versus time data exported to graphical chart output? Um, that will vary with, with which of the SOLIDWORKS products you're using. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Cosmos M, uh, you can uh, list the, uh, the temperature for a point, a node, uh, versus time. You get a, a table on screen, and then you can copy and paste that table into a text document and then import it into Excel. And memory says that's the way I did this. Okay. In Cosmos Works, you can display a, uh, a daughter window with uh, a similar approach. Okay. Thank you, Jack. Um, another question here is, uh, can I use the results of previous thermal stress analysis as an input to a new thermal stress analysis? Can I assume? I, I think that question, I'm going to rephrase that question. Can I use the results of a thermal analysis thermal analysis, yeah, as an input to a stress analysis? And the answer is yes. And you had already answered it during your presentation, too. Um, and there's a question about architectural materials like brick, mortar, wood, etc. Uh, I think. It's a person is interested in knowing how to get these properties. I mean, I know some of them um, are there as predefined materials in Cosmos, but probably not it's all of the minute. special architectural <laughs> materials. So where would uh, one get those properties from? Uh, it depends on, on, one, it depends on how much information, you, how, how accurate you need to be. Uh, I often use handbooks such as uh, the ASHRAE handbooks, uh, chemical engineering handbook, uh, mechanical engineering handbook, uh, handbook of chemistry and physics, and the like. Uh, there are there are web-based uh, resources as well. If you need a, an extremely uh, accurate uh, analysis, one very specific to the uh, case in point, you may actually need to take a physical sample and analyze it. You can also do a sensitivity analysis with uh, FEA to say, well, you know, uh, my results are only sensitive to the physical properties if the properties change more than 20%. Uh, and I know them within 20%, so I'm not that worried about it. Or they're sensitive to 1% changes. Or they're only sensitive to mass ch density changes, but not the thermal conductivity changes for the particular problem. So you need to answer the question. You need to know how well you need to know what you need to know before you can answer the question. I hope that wasn't too confusing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I guess uh, I think we got the point here. Um, for the person who answered the question was, um, uh, who asked this question, um, brick, mortar, wood, etc. yes, they are not as predefined materials in Cosmos. And as Jack mentioned, there are several sources to get these information from um, handbooks are valuable sources, and they're also web-based services. And to answer that question directly, no, we don't have those properties in Cosmos right now. Right now do I remember correctly that uh, you've reached an agreement with MatWeb to make them available? That's absolutely correct, yes. And uh, to you know, highlight more on what Jack just said, all Cosmos Works um, customers um, and all MatWeb 
uh, uh, professional service customers, I guess it's cost like forty to fifty dollars uh, annual fee, can actually get any materials that they want, material information that they want from matweb.com, which is a big source of uh, material information out there, um, can actually export those material data into um, the SolidWorks uh, material database format, which can be used for FEA analysis. And this service is free for all customers who subscribe to the MacWeb uh, professional service. You mean free to all customers who have Cosmos? Yes. Yes. Well, I mean. <laughs> Okay, I see that the person who asked the question about the split line has expanded their question. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, the model I had in mind is an electrical component, say an integrated circuit that produces some power. Is it better to create a model of the integrated circuit and apply the power to it, or create a split area on a printed circuit board and apply the power there? Uh, I think the answer to that depends on what the question really is. Are you concerned about what temperatures are uh, happening to the board? Are you uh, concerned about what the heat budget of the assembly is? Are you concerned about what the surface temperatures of the IC are? And uh, when you answer those questions, uh, it becomes clearer what, what the scope of the model needs to be. If you're interested in the temperature of the circuit board itself, not the circuit, not the IC, uh, and you're, you know, the, the IC is uh, sufficiently small that you don't have to worry about the fact that it's got a little more area for uh, heat transfer to the air, then you know, just use um, the printed circuit board and keep the model simpler. So he says, I'm concerned about the temperature of the circuit board. So, oh, OK. Uh, then I would think that. Uh, if he's concerned about the temperature of the circuit board itself, the, the, the green board, if you will, uh, then you don't need to model the IC? Absolutely. Well, I guess that pretty much um, comes to uh, the end of the questions we had here. There were several other questions related to Cosmos, but which I answered them. OK. Um, I think uh, with this, we can probably end this session. Thank you very much, Jack. That was a great presentation, I guess. And great. thanks for all the audiences out there. And hope you had a good time uh, listening to this presentation. And we'll have several other presentations coming up in the future. So please feel free to sign up for these and uh, you know enrich your knowledge. <laughs> OK. Take care, Arvind. And thank you all for attending. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye.